and welcome to the 83rd episode of the Ultimate Health Podcast. Jesse Chappis here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Today, we are interviewing Dr. Mark Brehenna. He is a dentist with a real holistic approach to the way he treats his patients, and he's a real educator online, sharing all kinds of great information on sleep apnea and on holistic oral care. So Dr. Mark is a Silicon Valley family and cosmetic dentist of over 25 years. He's the creator of AskTheDentist.com, whose mission is to help people take control of their dental health, get out of pain, and get unbiased answers about their teeth. Mark's done a TEDx talk. He's got a whole bunch of amazing YouTube videos online. So, so much education through his blog and his YouTube channel. You guys should go and check out his site, askthedentist.com, and make sure to follow up there after the interview. And that's what makes Mark really unique is that he's got this presence online, which is a really interesting way for him to not only connect with his patients, but to people around the world. There's not many practitioners doing this. So this is what we found. And this is how we found him, too. It's just uh, really quite special to be able to connect with someone and find out what they're so passionate about. So now I'm going to share an iTunes review. And this one is by Grub Girls from the USA. This is a five-star review titled, Great Podcast That Covers All Aspects of Becoming a Healthier Person. And this person writes, I enjoy the diversity of guests that are interviewed and the wide range of topics. I love the format and always come away from each podcast with one action that I can easily start right now. I listen during my commute and I'm thankful for the show notes, which allow me to go back and explore products that are mentioned or find out more about the guest. When I started my health journey, I picked several health podcasts to listen to, but this is the one that I ultimately chose to follow. Great podcast. Well, thank you so much for the kind words and the feedback. You guys are great. We've been getting so many awesome reviews, and we really appreciate each and every one of them. We read them all, and if you guys haven't already, be sure to go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash iTunes. Take a minute. Leave us some words explaining what you've gotten out of the show. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. So I want to share something exciting. Many of you guys know that I am a nutritionist and I have a food studio in Toronto where I teach all my cooking classes. And I've been doing that for many years, in-person classes. But as of recently, I have put together an online cooking course and it's available. It just became available last week and I'm super excited. And I'm going to be doing four different segments all around seasonal cooking, homemade recipes, gluten-free, plant-based, good things that you can learn about. So you'll see if you get it, and I hope you do, you'll see me in my food studio teaching you all kinds of awesome recipes. So the first one's available now, winter warming recipes, and I'm making all kinds of delicious recipes like kale cashew Caesar salad, a warming hot cho- white hot chocolate elixir, braised tempeh, roasted Brussels sprouts. So anyone anywhere in the world can now access these, and I'm just so excited to share to you guys. And I have a 10% discount going on right now. So to access this, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash homemade. That's H-O-M-E-M-A-D-E. And use the code homemade, but spell that in caps, and you will get 10% off. So I hope you get it and you make some delicious recipes at home and you enjoy it. So I'm just super excited to share that with you guys. And now a little love to Sun Warrior. I want to share a really awesome tip. Jesse and I are in Florida right now on a little vacay, which is much needed. And of course, we travel with our little sample packs of Sun Warrior, and I've got the Classic Plus with me. And for breakfast, we've been very lucky. Jesse's mom, we're staying with uh, Jesse's parents right now, and Jesse's mom made an amazing granola, which is actually my recipe. And we've been putting that on some coconut yogurt. And I opened up a pack of Sun Warrior Classic Plus and put that in some coconut yogurt this morning, mixed that up. We poured some granola on top, some fresh organic blueberries, and that was breakfast. So the tip is you can add protein powder into yogurt, into an almond milk or a rice milk or anything, and make the base of a cereal or an acai bowl or whatever you're doing high in protein and make it really delicious. So we had that this morning and it was very, very tasty. And uh, Jesse will let you know how you can get some Classic Plus Vanilla Protein, which is, as you guys know, our favorite. 
to get a 10% discount on your Sun Warrior Protein and all their products, all you need to do is go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. Orders grouped together of $100 or more in the US and Canada, you get free shipping. So we recommend doing that. Take advantage of this amazing deal. And you guys are going to love all that Sun Warrior has to offer. So back to our episode with Dr. Mark. So we had an amazing conversation with him and a big area of focus that we talked about was sleep. You know, a big passion of Jesse and mine is to get better quality sleep. And we've been working hard on that. And it was nice to be able to talk to someone, funny enough, a dentist who really specializes in sleep. But you'll you'll hear from the episode that it's all connected. So we talk about how you can get access to the best pillow ever and some of the best sleeping positions. This is really important for people to hear. We talk about snoring and how snoring definitely means you have a sleep problem, but if you're not snoring, you still need to be aware that you could have sleep apnea. We talk about oil pulling and how 20 minutes, which is the common number you'll see online that is required to get the benefits, we talk about how that isn't necessary. And we also talk about a tool that you can use to make flossing a whole lot easier. As we all know, flossing is really important to do every day, and Mark's got a great tip for that. So last thing we want to mention before we get into the show is that if you haven't gotten our Habits app yet, be sure to go and download your copy. It's a great adjunct to listening to the show because you can take some of the things you want to apply, add them in the app, and you can start practicing those and making them habits right away. All you need to do is go to gethabitsapp.com and everything you'll need is right there. So now it's time. We're going to get into things with Dr. Mark Berhenna. Hello, Mark, and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, it's such a pleasure. We're looking forward to getting into some good stuff with you. Yeah, thanks, Marnie. Okay, Mark, let's dive right in. You've written a book, The 8-Hour Sleep Paradox. You're a dentist, and I just want to go right for the obvious here. Why is a dentist writing about sleep? Well, it's a good question. In fact, it wasn't so obvious to me uh, because I was in the thick of it, but I have to give my oldest daughter, who helped me write the book, credit. You know, we were doing, you know, a year's worth of research and and comparing it to all the data I've collected in my practice. And finally, she turned to me and said, Dad, you know, what's a dentist doing talking about sleep apnea? You know, it's, it's because we can see it. Because of what happens in the mouth, we can see it well before anyone else can, like a physician or any other healthcare professional, because of our knowledge of tooth anatomy, um, you know, the airway, things like that. So it's early detection. And the earlier you detect something, the better. Okay, well, I want to break down some of the different things we're going to be talking about here. You use the term sleep disordered breathing as a catch-all term, and you just mentioned sleep apnea. So are those synonyms, or does sleep apnea fall under sleep disordered breathing, or can you just break that all down? Yeah, it is a little confusing. So sleep disordered breathing is just a very uh, kind of an umbrella term for anything that is disturbed by a small airway. So that would include snoring. That's kind of the least severe thing, although we'll talk later less severe, more severe than you would think. Uh, Obstructive sleep apnea, and uh, I sometimes use those interchangeably, obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing. And then something like UARS, which is upper airway resistance syndrome, and there are a few other conditions. So anything that will wake you up from a deep stage of sleep because you have problems breathing. And of course, we'll talk about that as well. Collapse of the airway, positioning, size of the tongue, and all those things. So that is the correct term. Sleep disorder breathing, that kind of covers all of that. Okay. So how many people suffer from disordered breathing during sleep? What are the stats on that? Well, initially, when I first got into this about seven years ago, the number was around 6%. And it just didn't make sense to me because I was seeing 20% in my practice. And uh, I've seen numbers as high as 30%. It depends on, you know, who you're reading and what you're reading. And, you know, are you including the whole umbrella, sleep disorder breathing, or just obstructive sleep apnea? But it's enough. I mean, it's it's an insidious uh, condition that even 6% is a, is a very, uh, is a big number. I mean, these are people that are, you know, at the wheel of your truck or at the helm of your plane and they are tired. And so it's 20 to 30%. It could even be higher. There's a study in 
Sweden of women between the ages of 20 and 50 with low BMIs. I mean, they picked on, they picked very healthy uh, women and it was almost 50% that had some form of sleep disorder breathing. So I think the number is a little elusive. My guess, based on what I've seen in my practice here in the Silicon Valley, it's 25%. And how are people finding out? Is it just that people are fatigued, they're tired? Are there other ways to figure it out other than, you know, going to a sleep clinic? Well, I mean, that that goes to to one of the cruxes in the book. Why is a dentist writing, or why should you listen to your dentist about uh, sleep disorder breathing? But in general, what I've seen is that people are tired, and they think it's part of the normal aging process. They've seen their parents get tired over time, and they think it's normal. So for a patient to go into to their primary care physician and specifically tell them, you know, listen, I think I'm having a disorder, a sleep disorder due to my breathing. I mean, that just never happens. I never hear it. I'm always the first one to say it to them. And sometimes they won't listen. They'll deny it. Especially if you tell a man that he's snoring, he'll say, well, I'm not snoring. Or if I am, it's it's good snoring. And so there's a lot of denial that goes on. So again, that's the great thing about what we've written in the book is that your dentist will be able to tell you even before you have any of the later symptoms that perhaps you would acknowledge, and that would be, oh, I'm taking a two-hour nap in the afternoon. I can't stay awake while I'm driving. I mean, those are all the typical things or scenarios that if people would recognize them as being such that they do have a, a problem sleeping, then they would mention that. But it just, it doesn't, there's no, there's a real mis- disconnect between the patient and the primary care physician. This discussion is just not being had. So as a dentist, what are some of these physical signs that you're seeing with patients or symptoms, things they're communicating with you that leads you to believe that a sleep study would be warranted or right away things that are clues for you that they have a problem? Right. That's a good question. Um, So let let me back up a little bit. I know my patients probably better than a primary care physician knows their patient. I see them every six months, every three months sometimes. I see them probably from the time they're a child to, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, to a middle-aged adult. So I can see behavioral differences. I also see my patients lying down. That's when sleep apnea is at its worst. That's when the gravity is acting on the jaw and the tongue and, and uh, you know, we're throwing water in their mouth. I know if they're breathing through their nose, because I am a dentist, you know, they're not able to breathe through their mouth. So can they breathe through their nose? And so first of all, being a dentist is important. Also, knowing your patient and seeing them that often is important. But the real concrete symptoms, and they're easily identifiable, are things like bruxism, that's grinding your teeth, clenching, which is a little less obvious, but you can see it in the muscles of facial expression and mastication, Lingual erosions, that's where the inside of the upper teeth are eroded away from stomach acids because GERD is, is, uh, comes along, is always seen, not always seen, but is very often seen with sleep apnea. So when you're lying down at night and sleeping, stomach acids kind of creep up into your mouth. Um, we see scalloped tongue, that's where the tongue is pushing out and up against the inner side of the upper arch or upper teeth. So we see scalloping on the inside of the tongue. Uh, fissured tongue, that's where there's a big deep uh, line down the center part of the top of the tongue. That's the tongue folding in on itself because it has no room at night when you're sleeping. At fractions um, are little ditches or little notches at the base of the teeth that come with gum recession. Those are on the outsides. Uh, and when those are present, we know that the patient is doing a lot of bruxism and grinding. And the grinding, the reason that is an interesting new way of thinking that perhaps this patient has sleep apnea. And again, previously to maybe a year ago, uh, when Levine's study came out, grinding was always stress and occlusal mechanics. And I still get hate mail sometimes from other dentists saying that's impossible. It can't be just that. And I'm not saying it is, but it is a good early indicator, especially if you get all the other symptoms along with it kind of a triad, you know, the GERD, the lingual erosions. I mean, that should start making a dentist think, you know, perhaps this person, along with BMI, overweight, some comorbidities of sleep apnea, like high blood pressure, you throw all this in together quickly and you see your patient every six months, every three months, it's very easy to come up with that diagnosis. And again, I use that term loosely, dentists are not allowed to diagnose sleep apnea. We can only screen for it. 
But it's there. As a dentist, we can see it. Again, our patient's lying down. They're having problems breathing. Uh, dentists are very knowledgeable with the development of the airway. It's always been there. That information has always been there. And we are now finally realizing that we can screen for this and send this patient off for an early diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, Mark, before we continue on here, do you have an idea of what is causing these symptoms? I mean, you're seeing all these things with your patients, but what is at the root cause? Is there something new in the 21st century that's having an effect on us as humans that's causing it, or or what's the root? Yeah, so the key, the key word there is something new. And by new, I would say the last hundred years, and I'll, I'll get into that. That's a very interesting topic. Um, in fact, that's kind of what I'm writing about in our next book, and that is the development of the oral airway. But typically, so here, here's the list. It's uh, lying down, large tonsils, long uvula, excessive flabby tissue in the throat. In other words, the patient's overweight, high BMI, the airway muscles are more relaxed. If you're drinking alcohol too close to bedtime, actually, as we age, those muscles lose their tone. And if we breathe in and we're asleep and our muscles are already paralyzed because we are in deep sleep, those muscles collapse, the airway collapses. Nasal congestion from cold to allergies. Deviated septum is another thing, another cause. Uh, menopause, which is something interesting. Women have a lower incidence of a sleep disorder breathing until, again, this is always bad news for women. There's always something associated with menopause, but they catch up with men after menopause or during menopause in terms of the uh, likelihood of having a problem sleeping due to collapsed airway. What else? Uh, hypothyroidism. But what you said earlier in your question was very interesting. There are some epigenetic changes perhaps that have occurred in the last hundred years. Our airway is getting smaller. We're seeing kids with smaller airways. We're seeing kids that respond to our environment, which has all sorts of issues like uh, food allergies. Our foods are different than they were 100, 200,000 years ago. Uh, the air quality is different. We're not breastfeeding as much, so that can affect the development of the airway. Our airway from day one, when we were able to speak out the alphabet and communicate with our neighbors linguistically, we have a compromised airway. We're standing upright. We have a kink in the air in the airway. The voice box is very sophisticated, so it's moved up a little bit in position to be able to pronounce certain words. So there's a lot of pressure on that little tiny little airway, which is about the size of a, it's a little bit bigger than a straw. And a lot of people, I think, think it's a big tube that they can shove food down and swallow golf balls, whatever, but it's not. It's quite small. And then as you get older, it gets smaller. You gain weight. You can gain weight in the airway. Your tongue can actually gain weight. So there are two phases to that question. Again, things that are new in our environment, the way we've developed, and then there are the the traditional answers, and that would be the, the being weight, uh, overweight as we get older, menopause, deviated septum. You could have fallen on your nose as a kid and then become a mouth breather, those kind of things. It's good to have that anatomical perspective because sometimes people don't think about that, the size of the airway. So thanks for bringing that up. So what are some of the short-term and long-term effects of disordered breathing? Well, the short-term is interesting. Uh, a lot of people, we all talk about the long-term effects. And I think that's why everyone kind of puts this off you know, okay, I'm snoring. Don't worry. I, I don't need to wear a CPAP and I don't want to wear a CPAP and I'm fine. I'm able to get up in the morning and go to work and I can run three miles. And, and that's human nature. We put that off until things get bad. And again, the long-term effects are things like dementia, Alzheimer's, high blood pressure, heart arrhythmias, uh, cancer is now on the list. I think breast cancer just got on the list. I think prostate cancer will be on the list soon. But the short-term effects are interesting. For example, you could not sleep well for two or three nights, get into a car, drive a long distance down a two-way road, and fall asleep at the wheel and kill yourself or kill someone else. That would be a short-term effect. I mean, the Exxon Valdez uh, was probably sleep apnea. There was a bus crash here in the Silicon Valley recently. They, everyone thinks it was sleep apnea. The Manhattan, there was a train that derailed in the Bronx about a year ago, maybe two years now. And I remember tweeting, because I remember googling it and seeing a face of the conductor and i realized right away that he had that face that i can recognize uh, of sleep apnea they took the picture down i tweeted that to all my followers a lot of them are physicians the physicians a lot of them tweeted back saying oh come on 
And a year later, the final conclusion was that he fell asleep and he had untreated sleep apnea. So those are the short-term effects. Again, sleep trumps everything, I always say. Food, you can starve yourself, you can not drink water, but two or three nights of no sleep at all, you'll go insane. I mean, you will just, you'll lose it. You mentioned some changes in the face, the physical structure. What are the things that you notice in someone that's been uh, suffering from sleep apnea for a period of time? Right. Well, I mean, there's certain facial angles, jaw angles, face shapes that dentists recognize and discuss all the time, especially the orthodontists. There's a certain look, and again, I know this sounds very unscientific, and I don't hold it too dear, but it is part of my assessment, and that is there's a certain look that I see And again, I know my patients well. I see them often. I know when they're having a bad day. I know when they're having a good day. But the muscles of facial expression and the muscles of mastication are affected by severe uh, or prolific nocturnal bruxing. That's grinding at night. I mean, think of it. You know, a tennis player has his tennis arm is slightly larger than his other arm. These are things that are subtle but can be noticed. There are other facial changes. For example, if the patient grows up breathing through their mouth. We can see dry lips. Typically, it's a lower lip. We can see red gums on just the anterior teeth. That's what we call a symptom of mouth breathing. There are little little hints that if you put them all together, it probably will lead you to believe that this patient is, this person's having problems breathing, has a small airway, even during the day. There are other symptoms, you know, uh, a nasally voice. Some people are very nasal sounding. And I always ask them when I hear that, I say, oh, by the way, it sounds like you're, do you have a cold now? Are you, are you uh, having, do you have trouble breathing through your nose? And so you put all this information together and it becomes pretty apparent that this person cannot breathe properly. And that changes the face, uh, teeth, arches, uh, lip posture, uh, shape of the face, and just the overall look. We know sleep apnea or disordered breathing is due to a constriction to that airway. But can you explain while somebody's sleeping, what is happening if they have sleep apnea? I know it has to do with snoring and gasping for air, but can you kind of break that down? What What is happening with that person? That's a good question. Um, I don't think we we really you know think about what actually anatomically is happening and what is your night like? Because again, we're asleep. And when I say arousal or disturbance in sleep, you know, that means someone coming from a very deep stage, N4, N3, into a lighter stage of sleep of N2, perhaps. Those are the stages. And again, most of us are pretty much unconscious, even in a lighter stage of sleep. Maybe we're aware of something, but we can't quite remember it. So again, we're really lousy at self-assessing sleep because again, we're in a state, a state of sleep. So it's very difficult to really have any idea of whether you're suffering or not. Okay, and I think it's important too we dig into the different types of sleep apnea. We're talking about obstructive here when there's actually a physical change with the airway, Mm -hmm. but let's talk about central and mixed types. Right. So central and mixed. So I see a lot of patients that have mixed. So I'm, I'm reading these sleep studies, and again, I'm not diagnosing sleep apnea. I'm just uh, part of the treatment modality. So, for example, if the CPAP or surgery isn't working and the patient can't tolerate the CPAP, then physicians will write a prescription for an oral appliance. And we can talk about that later. So before you asked what is actually happening, you're lying down, you are falling asleep, and as you go into deep sleep, your muscles are paralyzed. The only muscles that are working, of course, are your heart and your diaphragm, and of course, the muscles around your eyes. And everything's relaxed, including the airway muscles. And that, you know, when you take a breath in, then it's like a balloon. The the balloon will collapse and you either the airway is partially open and you can make like a, it's like blowing on a clarinet. You know, the reed vibrates up against the mouthpiece and that's what snoring is. There's a lot of redundant tissue there, flapping, narrowing, and it makes the air is speeding up. There's a venturi effect and that's what makes the noise. Or the airway can completely close. And remember, you do not have to have symptoms of snoring to have sleep apnea. So if the airway closes completely, you're silent, you stop breathing for more than 10 seconds. That's the definition of an apnea, a moment of no breath. And then, of course, your body is alarmed by that. I mean, your body is still regulating things and a fight or flight response occurs. 
you excrete that adrenaline and it's like you've seen a grizzly bear or a man coming at you with a big bowie knife in your in the middle of the night and you wake up again you're in a lighter stage of sleep you may not be aware of it and then of course you go back to sleep and the airway narrows again and this can happen 30 50 70 times an hour i mean how much can your adrenal glands take of this and this is why people wake up anxious in the morning because there is a behavioral component to sleep apnea and that is you are fighting for your life at night it's almost like waterboarding. That's why waterboarding is so effective. It basically is getting you very close to the point of suffocation. And that's what sleep apnea is. You're suffocating at night. Wow. It's, you know, to paint the picture like that and actually picturing someone going through that, you know, snoring is, is something that uh, I see beside me with, uh, with Jesse. Oh. <laughs> um, and, and, and even just, uh, you know, auditory wise, it's, it's, right. it's enough to kind of frighten me out of my sleep, but, uh, right. <laughs> but it, it's an interesting subject and, you know, people, so many people are suffering from it, but I want to talk about snoring. A lot of people associate it with people who are overweight. And I know that that's obviously from what we've been talking about is not necessarily the case. Right. So is there a body type? I know we're talking about face type. But is there certain body types that are more prone to it? Well, that, yeah, that used to be the thinking that there was a body type. It was the large white overweight male. I mean, with a high BMI, large neck size, again, neck size is another indicator of sleep apnea, um, you know, 17 inch neck or higher. You can ask someone their shirt size. I mean, a man, his shirt size, that that's interesting information to include in the screening of sleep apnea. But I don't go by that anymore. I mean, I'm here in the Silicon Valley and here in California, everyone's fit. I mean, they come in, they're thin, they're fit. They work 70 hours a week. Uh, they brag about not sleeping a lot because they don't need to. I mean, that's one of my favorite things about sleep apnea is that we're all in denial. So again, I'm a perfect example. I, I had mild sleep apnea, 12 interruptions per hour. I mean, I'm used to being in the back country at 14,000 feet on skis for six nights in the winter for, you know, six days and, you know, thin air and, and carrying a 50, 60 pound pack. So I'd never thought that was an issue until I sought out that diagnosis. And, and again, I corrected it. I have zero interruptions now. I wear an oral appliance. And I have to say there is a difference between being fit and having 12 interruptions and being fit and probably being more fit and having zero interruptions. So it may seem subtle to some people, but sleep is everything. Sleep is so important short-term and long-term. So the body types are very misleading. Again, that Swedish study that I told you about, they, they, it was a great study because they took people that looked thin they took women before menopause and they checked them for sleep apnea. And you would think that there would be a very low incidence of sleep apnea or sleep disturbed breathing. And it was actually high. And that's why that uh, study was so surprising. So body types, I mean, yeah, large necks, facial changes, bruxism, you know, those are all, I guess you could call uh, not body types, but body characteristics. But body types, I would not go by that anymore. Of course, if someone walks in and he's very large and overweight and has a huge neck and a lot of fat in his neck and and there's no room in his mouth because his tongue is so large, of course. But I would not think that someone who's fit and thin that comes in may not have it. So, so I would say body types, be careful. Do not use that as your sole indicator for any kind of sleep disturbed breathing. So there's a myth busted and that takes me into our next topic. In your book, you discuss sleep myths that are killing us. And the first one here, this relates again to what we were just talking about. If you aren't snoring, you're fine. And this to me, reading it was was a big surprise because I just thought most people snored and that was part of normal human sleep activity. So let's start out there. If people are snoring right away, do they know there's a problem? Yes. You can only snore if your airway narrows to the point where it can vibrate. And again, as you said, you don't have to snore to have sleep apnea, and that's another situation. But, but yeah, snoring's serious. I mean, we, I mean, my daughter and I, while we were writing this book, we were looking up, uh, you know, snoring references, and they were all comical. You know, they were like, you know, there's one of Bambi snoring, and the family thinks it's cute. I mean, of course, I know those are that's an, uh, another species, but snoring has been funny. Look at look at. Uh, the Marx Brothers. I mean, look at uh, the Three Stooges. I mean, snoring has been portrayed in Hollywood and and in the media as being something cute and funny or disgusting, but never do they allude or, or refer to the seriousness of snoring. It is not a funny matter. It is, I think, spouses. Uh, I mean, Marnie, you just gave me what we call a sleep partner report. 
And that is, oh, you know, my husband snores or my spouse snores. And, and that's important information. And of course, they keep you up and then both of you are not sleeping well. But that doesn't really get reported. I think some spouses think it's funny or they move into the next room, they elbow their spouse, they roll them over, and then they just move on. So snoring is serious. Snoring, snoring should be a big alert. And I think I, I would say to anyone listening, if you're snoring or you know of someone that is snoring, like a loved one or a sleep partner, action needs to be taken. Well, I think in uh, researching for this podcast, Jesse's taken some of your information to heart. In the last couple nights, Mm -hmm. he's been sleeping on his side. And last night, because normally he snores between like 4 and 7 a.m. That's normally when I notice it the Mm -hmm. most, or maybe that's just when I'm waking up. But he did not snore last night. He was on his side. He was breathing heavy, but there was not the the nasal kind of snore. So... I don't know. I know it's a challenge for him to sleep on his side, but uh. <laughs> well, they have they have devices. So what you're referring to is a, a positional uh, effect on the airway, and the tongue, of course, is not parallel to gravity. It's 90 degrees to gravity, and it lies on its side. Uh, there are things that will. I mean, I would for Christmas or birthday buy him something. Actually, you'd be buying yourself something. Buy him a device that forces him on his side. And so what it sounds like is that Jesse has a very minor case of maybe it may even just be you know upper airway resistance syndrome something like that but there is an improvement from being supine to lying on your side and that's there there is something called positional therapy so when i make someone an oral appliance this is after the cpap and surgery has failed or or has helped to some degree but you know we want to get that ahi down to zero so we make the oral appliance and in reading the sleep study they record where the AHI is highest and what body position, which is very important information. And I actually, when I see that there is a change in AHI with position, that's a good indicator that the oral appliance will work well for me. So that's encouraging when I see that. But it also tells me that I should perhaps uh, instruct the patient to go out and buy one of these devices that forces them on their side because the two together make a big difference. So yes, sleeping on your side does make a big difference. And it's great that you're noticing that. That's what that's what every sleep partner, spouse, and loved one, that's what I tell parents to do with their kids. I would I tell parents, my patients always go into your kids' room at least once a month. And if there's a problem, maybe more often, when the kid goes to bed at 10, I want you in there at midnight. I want you sitting there in the dark room, sitting there for 15 minutes listening to your child. Observe what position they're in. Is there any noise? Are they thrashing around? Are they kicking the covers off? Are they talking in their sleep? Night terrors, all those things are great indicators of what your child's airway is like. So sleep partner report, you did a great job, Marnie. You've told me a lot. If he sleeps on his side, that is great information. Well, Mark, it's interesting too, because I wear a Fitbit to sleep and I'm not sure what your opinion is on the data that the Fitbit gives or if you're aware of what it gives, but it basically shows restless sleep and time when I'm awake. Mm -hmm. And last night I slept better according to that as well, better than I have as far back as I can remember. So there's that correlation there, which is really interesting as well. Yeah, I mean, my view on that, I write about it in the book, um, and we did some research on the devices. I'm not against them, but here's the problem. I have patients that come in, and I tell them that they have a problem, and they go, yeah, but look at my Fitbit, I'm pretty good. It's very loose information. It's, um, It's not definitive. I like it when a patient has a Fitbit, I make them an oral appliance, it's been properly adjusted and calibrated, And then they come in and they go, you know what, when I forget to wear my device, my Fitbit tells me I'm moving around a lot. When I'm wearing it, it tells me that I'm not. So I think it's good for reinforcement of therapies and and post-surgery, that kind of thing. But to actually make a diagnosis off of those things, I think is very dangerous. So that's what we warn about uh, in the book. One thing I do like, and perhaps you got that from the book, Jesse, is that sleep analyzer, that iPhone app. And again, it falls in the same category as the Fitbit. It's not used to diagnose anything. It's not, I would never clear myself from thinking that I sleep apnea because I did well on the sleep app. But it's a great way. A lot of people don't have time. They don't have the money or the wherewithal to go get a sleep study because they are expensive and insurance companies don't always pay for them if you don't have the comorbidities of sleep apnea, like being overweight, having high blood pressure, aging prematurely. You know, it's funny. They want you to be really sick before they even think about looking at that. But let's say you're young and healthy and your sleep partner has reported some noise in certain positions. Pull out the sleep app and listen to yourself. It gives you a count of how many times you were snoring and 
that gives you some idea that that leads you to maybe getting a diagnosis. And, and so I, I like it in that regard. The technology out there is good for that. But boy, do not let it be your sole criteria in deciding whether you should go see your doctor or not. That is would be very dangerous. Right. I just like that association with the information we got there from Marnie about not snoring. So I found that right. that interesting for sure. Well, I think anyone that uses these apps is interested in their own health. I think that's a good sign. I mean, uh, that alone is good. I just, I, I again, practice in the Silicon Valley and I love my engineer patients dearly. Trust me, I'm, I'm a kind of a nerdy engineer myself. But, you know, they start hacking their own sleep. That's what I call it. And it's like, whoa, 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 you know, leave it to the professionals, you know, don't make any decisions based on your apps and technology and, you know, listening devices and all that, leave it to the professionals. So it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, um, I, I think we're going, we were talking about, a, you know, your dog earlier and, and my dog that works at the practice. And, and I'm, I guess I'm half joking when I say this, but, you know, we have trained dogs to sniff out cancer and diabetes and, and I'm hoping I can teach Remy, my little Havanese to sniff out sleep apnea. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> so, Mark, next myth here we're going to get into, and and I already know the answer to this one. Well, I know because it's a myth, but you've also talked about these oral appliances. So, mm-hmm. next myth is people with sleep disorders need to sleep with a machine, and that machine would be a CPAP. I want you to start off by explaining what that is. It's for a lot of people who get diagnosed and and get that sentence of having to wear one of these machines while they sleep. I think I think they feel like it's the end of the world. But uh, yeah. let's talk about some of these different options for people if they know they have sleep apnea. Yeah, good question. Let me just start off by saying that I have patients tell me that they would rather die than wear that machine. So that gives you some idea. These are mostly men, of course. The machine they're referring to is a CPAP, although I prefer the APAP. There's a BiPAP. This is a little box that sits by your bed for the people that don't know what it is. It sits by your bed. The box used to be bigger. It's smaller. Now it's quieter. It has a little uh, compressor pump in it. And there's a tube that rolls over to your side of the bed and connects to a mask that is strapped onto your, there's a full face mask, there's a nose pillow system. I mean, there are many different ways of of connecting that tube to your airway. And through continuous positive pressure, in the case of the CPAP or APAP, it's preventing that balloon, that flaccid, relaxed, flappy balloon of your airway from collapsing because it's forcing air in there. It's blowing you up literally blowing you up and keeping that airway patent. So that's the machine that everyone in, you know, it's funny how, you know, you tell someone about uh, sleep apnea and they right away, that's the first thing that pops in their mind. I'm not wearing the mask or do I, does that mean I have to wear the mask? And, and so everyone instinctually knows what that is. They've seen it somewhere or they've heard about it. Maybe a parent is wearing it or something or a sibling. So that's the great fear. It's, it's, a, there's something, I mean, they're stigmatized just by thinking of that, that mass. So it's unfortunate because it is actually a very non-invasive, tried and true method of giving you a good night's sleep and saving your life. And so I, I as a dentist, uh, you know, I am kind of the second line in terms of treatment, but I always reinforce, I would, I always tell my patients, please try the CPAP. I even give them some tips. I send them to websites. I mean, that's really something that, you know, their CPAP mask fitters should be doing for them but uh, or the physician often it does not get done fortunately just hand them the box and expect them to use it it's very technique sensitive you know there are certain complications like gas in the morning distension bloating uh, dry mouth you know those kind of things and of course who wants to wear a mask when they go to bed with their loved one so that's the mask the second well not the second in line but other modalities of treating a smaller airway surgery of course and i talk about that in the book It's a complicated thing. Certainly for children, the first thing they consider are the tonsils and adenoids. That's kind of come back into favor. My generation, they stopped doing that. It's a very safe surgery. Uh, I recommend it often to patients, and it seems to work very well. It really calms the child down. It it helps them focus in school just because they're sleeping better. So, so surgery is definitely, it's a very complicated topic. I'm certainly not the expert in it. I've talked to a lot of ENTs. I've talked to a lot of oral maxillofacial surgeons and everyone's got their different take on that. And of course, Stanford, one of the best sleep clinics in the world is here and they have lots of interesting 
ways of dealing with that. So, and then there's the little humble, small, forgotten for a while oral appliance. The oral appliance is simply a device that you put in your mouth. Only a dentist can provide that for you. And it's like a upper lower night guard with two, with a connection. It can be bars, it can be straps, uh, little rubber bands, whatever. But the connection is such that it either pulls or pushes your jaw forward. And of course, maybe I didn't say this earlier in the, our conversation, but when you go to sleep at night and your muscles relax, the masseter, the big muscle that holds the jaw in place, relaxes. The jawbone and the tongue, which is all connected, is quite heavy. And of course, that's affected by gravity. That all falls back into the back of the throat. It, it narrows the airway. Well, this device, just by wearing it, simply supports it. It keeps it propped up and held in position, even a more forward position than you would during the day, and that airway never collapses. So it's simple. It's been around for a long time. It does have its cons, although they're usually fixable. Bite changes, TMJ, TMD, jaw pain. Uh, I only see that about 2 to 3% of the time, maybe 5% at the most. But here's the thing. Most people, they hear about that, and they want to bypass the CPAP. They want to go right to the oral appliance. And again, I don't encourage patients to do that because the CPAP is a, is a good thing to try. Many of my patients are doing both. They find that we're in the CPAP, that's called hybrid therapy. They find that we're in the CPAP or APAP in this case. That's an automatic CPAP, a machine that senses the back pressure and the collapse and changes its pressure appropriately, and which is a lot more comfortable because you're not breathing at the same rate all night long. So I mean, there, there'll be changes and the CPAP just kind of chugs along where the APAP can adjust to that. So wearing an APAP and a, an oral appliance is a great idea. Positional therapy, as we discussed earlier, with a oral appliance is great. So it's really, it's when you're skinning the cat, bad analogy, but it's difficult to do. I mean, it's really complex and you need your doctor, your dentist, your CPAP technician. You want them all on with you, you need to communicate with them, and there is a way to get you to sleep well. And it may just not be one device. So when they, when patients come to me and say, I want that, you know, I, I slow them down and I say, listen, this is gonna be a long road and we have to do it right and we have to find out what works best for you. So those are the three devices or, or methods of opening the airway. There are new things coming. There's a pacemaker device that is implanted in your chest and a wire that's put into your neck to in, implanted into the tongue and you wave your iPhone or smartphone over the pacemaker, the device uh, before bedtime and it innervates the tongue. It keeps the tongue nice and flat and straight the tongue and prevents the tongue from rolling up into a little ball and basically sealing your, like a little golf ball, sealing the, the airway shut. I think that has about 60% efficacy right now. And I think it's getting approval or has been approved in the U.S. But again, that's an extreme, extreme solution. Of course, you would try the CPAP first. So, so the oral appliance is kind of my domain. I like it. It's helped a lot of people. I've done over a thousand. It's just so gratifying to see someone over the six to eight weeks. Sometimes it's in three days to see their lives change and uh, all because of a simple little oral device. Well, thanks for breaking that down. There's a lot to take in there. It is, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> the next myth is that sleep problems can be cured with hacks. Hacks are so big right now. It's all about finding the fast cure, the fast relief. So can we elaborate on this and how we, you know, how that is a myth for a lot of people dealing with sleep disorders? Yeah. Yeah. Again, here in the Silicon Valley, I mean, all my patients think they've got it under control, that they can do something. A sleep hack would be like, or a sleep hygiene thing would be making the room dark, white noise machines, uh, sleeping alone, putting the animals outside of the room. I mean, proper bedding, getting rid of your carpet so that your nose is free and clear, you know, reduce allergies. Uh, these are all kind of little things that my patients, once they hear that I think they have sleep apnea, they're like, oh, I can take care of this. I've been meaning to do this for a while. I, I will take care of it. Uh, you know, you can even buy a little oral appliance online. You can go, usually it's men's journal or something in the back and you can buy these little $60 devices or even $20 devices and, and to, you know, keep your jaw from falling back. So there are all these little things that patients have read about, seen, or maybe heard about from another, uh, you know, a loved one or a family member. And the point is, is that the sleep hacks are great. They're important, 
But if you have a small airway, a sleep hack is not going to get you to where you need to be. A, you need to diagnose it, you need to quantify it, you need to know how bad it is. And if you're just playing around with sleep hacks and Fitbits and keeping your head elevated or buying the new beds now that you can buy for home where, you know, or sleeping in a lazy boy, these are all sleep hacks. Um, you're playing with fire. You could be on your way to some serious systemic diseases because you've been hacking away at your sleep and you haven't really quantified what actually how bad your sleep is. So I, I'm very wary of the sleep hacks. That's certainly part of the equation. Certainly after you have the diagnosis and you're being treated. And if you have a CPAP or an oral appliance, it's still going to be difficult to sleep in a noisy room with the lights on and and noisy neighbors. And if the room's too warm, you know, they say below 68 degrees. All those things are important. I'm not saying they're not. But if you think that that's going to make you sleep better and you actually have a anatomical uh, issue with your airway, then you're fooling yourself and you're headed towards some serious uh, life consequences. So what are some sleep hygiene modalities that we can implement that you actually do recommend to help people have and encourage a better sleep? Right. Well, you heard me refer to some of them already. My favorite is a pillow. And I've been experimenting with pillows for a long time, and I think I've got it figured out. I was sleeping on down pillows and the foam pillows, and they were too low. So I'll tell you my story. Um, I had a lot of neck issues and neck pain in the morning, levators, traps, even shoulder girdle pain. And that's, I found late and I was dealing with it with Pilates and that was helping a little bit. And, but what really took care of it was he was curing my sleep apnea, you know, going from 12 interruptions to zero interruptions. It turns out I was lifting my head off the pillow at night because when you suffocate, that you, that's what you do. You pull your head forward a little bit. So if you're choking on a piece of food, that's an involuntary motion. You tend to kind of, it's like that, what a chicken does with his head. He kind of bobs, forwards and backwards. And, and when you see a choking person, that's what they're doing. That actually, you're, you're trying to open the airway by positioning your, your head forward on the, on the spine. And so you do that lying down, your head weighs about 12, 13 pounds. And you do that, let's say someone has an AHI of 50, 50 times an hour. Yeah, you're going to wake up with severe neck pain in the morning. So the pillow uh, hack is this. My pillows were too soft. And when I was sleeping on my side to open the airway, unconsciously, of course, subconsciously, my neck would kink downwards because the pillow would not support my head as it would if I was sleeping on my back. So what I tell patients is to go out and buy a pillow. I make recommendations in the book on which company to buy it from. And it's a pillow that seven, eight years ago, I would have said that was not a comfortable pillow, but it's a pillow that supports you and doesn't collapse overnight like a down pillow does or a foam pillow. And it's a pillow that is measured in such a way you would take a measurement from the top of your shoulder bone to your neck. And if you have a, if that's a large distance, you need a larger pillow because sleeping on your side, you want to keep your head straight. You don't want to kink up and you don't want to kink down because that would make your airway smaller. And then of course you would be lifting your head off the pillow a lot to try and keep breathing. So I think a firm pillow bigger than you would expect is a great sleep hack. And this pillow, also the one I recommend, is something you can throw in the washer and dryer. And that takes all the bug mites and dust mites and all that out. So there's a hypoallergenic kind of benefit to that because you're not going to be stuffed up at night and have stuff you know. So I think that's one great example. I think a pillow makes a big difference. It did for me. And it took me about a year to really hack away at which pillow. And this company is great. They, I ordered three pillows and was able to return two and then and play around with them. So, so it even comes with a 10 year warranty. I, I don't try and push things, but uh, again, that's the only pillow that has worked for me. So I would work on pillows, find the right pillow. What's the specific brand name of this pillow? Just so we can link it up in the show notes. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's uh, my pillow. I think it's called MyPillow.com. I read about it in the wall street journal about 10 years ago and he's all over now. I mean, he sells them direct and the pillow has a 10 year warranty. Uh, they're well-made Again, it's not the pillow you would expect you would be comfortable with. But remember, if your airway is, is small at night and collapsing, you're not going to get a good night's sleep. I don't care what pillow or what mattress you're on or how thin you are or how in great shape you are, or how exhausted you are uh, and how quickly you fall asleep. When your airway collapses, all that stuff gets thrown out. You're just dancing around the uh, the main problem there. Yeah, that makes sense. 
What we'll do is we're going to link everything over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com, including this pillow, and we're going to have a nice show summary. So listeners, you guys don't have to scramble and uh, type that into your phone and try and find it. Just uh, go to the website and show notes are right there. So Mark, one other thing I want to dig into a little bit further is sleep position. We've been saying a lot about sleeping on one side. Is that right for everybody? Is that where you try and get your patient sleeping or does that depend on the person? Well, it depends on the person. And as you know, personally, Jesse, you you sleep better on your side. If your airway is better on your side, then you will move less. In other words, you will have more uninterrupted sleep. You'll go for a few hours and not move as opposed to waking up every 10, 30 seconds or every few minutes. And so here's the problem though, is that you know, I don't know what the best position is. Uh, I, th- I would think sleeping on your back is. S- sleeping on your stomach, I've heard, is not good. It's not good for your back. And I know a lot of people that have really small airways do sleep on their stomach. Children will sleep on their elbows and their knees with their butt up in the air if they have a smaller airway. I've seen that before in a sleep clinic. I, I will sometimes go visit a sleep clinic and stay up through the night and watch people sleep. It's a uh, Painful thing to do, but it's uh, interesting. Um, so sleeping on your side can help. The problem there is that some people get a numb shoulder or numb arms. And I think the solution there would be to get the right mattress. You have to get a mattress that allows you to sleep without putting pressure points on your shoulder. So, of course, if your arm goes to sleep, you may want to roll over for that. And that would be a disturbance, you know, not related to airway. So I think everyone's different. I think a lot of it has to do with the mattress. If you are a side sleeper, you do have to probably go with a foam mattress that will let the shoulders sink in and not put too much pressure on it. I think a conventional mattress would not be good for a side, sleep, a side sleeper. So it's hard to say. There is no one good position for sleeping. I think the best position is the one where you sleep longest for without moving. That makes sense. And on, on the side, should someone rotate sides or just wherever they're comfortable? Well, they say for your heart, the best side to sleep on is the left side. Mm-hmm. I think most people will roll over and change because of the shoulder and circulation issues. Uh, I think one side or the other is fine as far as the airway goes. There's, I mean, there's a symmetry there where I don't think there would be much difference. Uh, but, you know, I sleep on my back with my oral device and uh, that's the most comfortable for me and with the right pillow. So, but I think that's a very individual thing. And again, that's something you kind of have to figure out. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So one last thing we want to wrap up with before we change and switch gears sure. is you mentioned earlier about a lot of, you know, your execs talking about <laughs> not getting enough sleep and and that's a good thing. So what is this badge of honor that we feel like we're a hero if we're not getting a lot of sleep? I slept two hours last night. I'm I'm a tank. I can do this. Why do we need to prove this? <laughs> and uh, Yeah. How can we change this? Let me speak for the male gender. Okay. Uh, being one myself. Uh, I think, I mean, I raised three daughters and I was very proud of the fact that I could hear them sneak in late at night. I was a light sleeper. I always thought being a light sleeper was okay. It's kind of like that disconnect with snoring, like snoring's not a big issue. It is a real disconnect. Being a light sleeper is, until I realized what good sleep was, wearing my old clients, going from 12 interruptions to zero, I mean, my sleep now is amnesic. I go to sleep and I wake up at 5.30 in the morning and I'm disoriented. I have, it's still dark outside and I have no idea how much time has, has passed. Where if you're a light sleeper, you pretty much are checking in and rolling over and you know kind of how much time has passed. And so being light sleep is not, is not normal. I mean, it is not, it's not healthy. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, it's um, amnesic sleep is is the best. There should be no sense of time at all. Okay, Mark, that uh, we really went in depth with the uh, sleep apnea stuff, and I'm sure that's going to help a lot of people. So I'm glad we uh, really dug in. But now we're going to switch gears and talk about oral health. And I'm going to start with the controversial subject here, fluoride. And most of the people in the natural health world, the people in our audience are against its use. They want it out of the water supply, toothpaste, They opt out at the dentist from getting the fluoride gel in those trays that sit on the teeth. And there's evidence out there that it lowers IQ, it damages the bones, the teeth, has negative effects on the brain. Dr. Mercola, who's a lot of our listeners know and and follow his work, he's got a strong stance against fluoride. There's the book Fluoride Deception talking about a lot of this, and it's just a known poison. So, 
why I bring all this up is because while I was researching for the interview, I came across information, I believe it was on your website, saying that right before bed, you like to use a fluoride paste to remineralize your teeth. So I just, I'm just curious with all these negative effects, how, how do you justify that? And is, is this just a lot of misinformation in the natural health world? Is fluoride really as bad as it's supposed to be? Or I'll let you just run with that. Yeah, that boy, you just hit on a big topic there. I'm happy to talk about it. I have to say that from day one, from my first day as being a dentist, I was against the ingestion of fluoride. And I graduated about the same time that my firstborn was born. So uh, I went out of my way to find a industrial grade distiller and we distilled our water. That's the only way to remove fluoride completely. Reverse osmosis does not. And so that, but I did that based on just gut instinct. Um, I just wasn't crazy about, I mean, I was taught in school that ingestion of fluoride and with the growing teeth and the enamel organ, I mean, that was all supposedly would make the tooth more resistant to decay. And it does, uh, but it's more complicated than that. So it was always a lesser of two evil argument for me. I, I read about both camps and all the research even the fact that it was a communist plot that still existed 30 years ago, which is amazing. But I always thought to myself, okay, well, okay, so my kids will have a few more cavities and I won't have to worry about all the other effects. I grew up in San Francisco, ingested fluoride in the water, and I have what's called fluorosis, a very mild form of having too much fluoride in my teeth. Those are little white specks that you can barely see, but they're there. A more severe version of that, again, if you ingested too much fluoride as a child growing up and the teeth were developing, and being exposed to all that fluoride in the bloodstream, which is where it goes after you ingest it, then those little white spots become brown spots and they actually become, the teeth become more likely to have cavities. In other words, the teeth are weakened. So we know what the optimal amount is for reducing the chances of decay. It is kind of a rubber stamp kind of method of trying to bring down decay, especially in the poorer, lower socioeconomic uh, communities. So, Again, for me, lesser of two evils. I didn't, all that other stuff scared me. I can't prove that it does. I, both sides are very convincing. But here's the thing fluoride does work topically. And I've, I'm stopped growing. My teeth are not developing anymore. So there's no harm in applying the right amount of fluoride. Again, there's some, some mystery there, some controversy there, because the fluoride in toothpaste is pretty much a joke. It's the same, almost the same amount that's in the water, but that's a different mode of of intake. That's ingestion where toothpaste is just application. But so the reason I, and again, I'm trying to differentiate between the two. There's ingestion of fluoride as a child when the teeth are developing and that ends by age 14. And then there's the application of fluoride topically, which if you have recession, if you've been a grinder all your life, you have a small airway, you've been grinding and you're teeth, the gums have receded and you get those little notches at the base of your teeth and you drink something that's very sweet or something very cold and your teeth ache, you pretty much, the best way to handle that, to manage that is to use a topical fluoride. The fluoride is literally armor plating like calcium does, but even more so the fluoride ion and the calcium ion are very similar, but the fluoride ion is more likely to bond and stay bonded to that porous area of the tooth and it strengthens, it strengthens the tooth in an adult. And it prevents root decay, which is something that I see in a lot of adults after the age of 60. And that's a real problem because if decay comes in from the root side, you're more likely to get a root canal between six-month visits and crowns and implants and all that. So, so fluoride works well in some cases. There is a place for it. I still, and I have to be honest, I don't have all the data. I've been meaning to write about this and blog about it, but I've been sitting on this topic for six years now, and it is so difficult and so emotional. And if you bring it up at a dental convention or at a functional health convention, it doesn't matter. Even at the dinner table, it is loaded with just so much misinformation, emotionalism, politics, you know, municipal water supplies, uh, you know, voting it out. So again, It's a lesser of two evils for me. I don't want it in my water. I don't want to ingest it. I don't want my kids to ingest it. I will use it topically. And I have to kind of do more research and find out really what the answer is. And again, both sides are very convincing. It is a very difficult topic. 
Well, thanks for bringing your perspective. It's interesting to hear more on it, and it's, it's, it's a subject that comes up quite a bit. Yeah. So let's talk about oil pulling and whitening teeth. What are your thoughts on oil pulling? Okay, oil pulling. Um, God, when I first heard about it, I said, God, that would be great if it really does reverse gum disease. And it's an old Ayurvedic uh, method, and I think it does have a place in modern society. I have a lot of patients that do use it. It does not cure gum disease. Clearly, it does not. There are studies on that. Does it affect, my theory is that if it can prevent gum disease, because it manages very nicely, unlike mouthwash, uh, it manages the microbiome in the mouth, I think, very well. So if you're oil pulling with coconut oil or and you do that on a routine basis, I think that's a great way to establish the right a ratio of good to bad bacteria in your mouth. If you were to go out and rinse with Listerine and do that for a few weeks, you're blowing everything up in the mouth. You're killing, the kill rate is high. You're killing everything. It's like an antibiotic. And then you're actually promoting growth of bacteria and the wrong bacteria and the wrong ratio to each other. So if you compare it to use the use of a mouthwash, I would say oil pulling is a great thing. I just don't like to see it mentioned in the same sentences of being the cure-all for gum disease. That clearly does not uh, does not happen. Right. And a lot of times, mostly every time I've seen this online, different articles written about it, it always says you have to do it for 20 minutes to get the benefit. Is this something you've noticed or something that you've come across as well? Because I think that timeline really is daunting for a lot of people and they don't get into it because of that. It is. That is very daunting, especially in today's world. Well, I mean, you could certainly walk around the house at the end of the evening and as you're checking the doors and the dogs and the animals and the lights and but I still think it is daunting I have not seen any clinical evidence or or studies that indicate that five minutes is not as good as 20 minutes I think frequency certainly is more important than the actual time spent so if you were to oil pull three times a day because the mouth is so volatile, it's, a, it's an orifice that's open and exposed to the outside. It can dry out. It's exposed to foods. I mean, it has multi-purposes. And, you know, it's not, it's not like an eardrum or a, or a nasal passage. It's, it's more exposed to the outside environment. And there's a lot of stuff coming through it. So I think the frequency of oil pulling is more important. But again, I have not seen any data on this. But my uh, instinct on that would be three times a day for three or four minutes is way better than once 20 minutes a day. Okay. And I want to touch upon something you brought up earlier about uh, we're not breastfeeding as a society as much and, you know, babies having physical differences in their jaw structure. Can you speak to this about breastfeeding versus, you know, pacifiers, sippy cups and how that's affecting infants' jaws into their later years? Right. Yeah, this, uh, it's hard to talk about breastfeeding being, a, a man and, you know, to tell women or to explain to them that, you know, breastfeeding for up to a year or, or longer is a good thing, especially if it's a working woman. I mean, my wife and I certainly faced that. It was difficult. So breastfeeding, you know, usually we think of breastfeeding being good because of the breast milk um, and the nutrients and the uh, the uh, the transference of immunology and, and all that immune benefits. Uh, but here's the other thing that I don't think gets talked often about often enough, and that is the act of breastfeeding. You know, the child sucking on the mother's nipple, and uh, that has an effect on the development and the shape. In other words, the final grown-up mature shape of the mouth, teeth, uh, positioning of the teeth, arch form, palate, height of the palate, width of the palate, tongue position, and movement upon swallowing and hence even part of the airway so you compare that to a silicone nipple from a bottle or a sippy cup or a straw and it may not seem that obvious but but sucking on a straw or something that's rigid like a silicone nipple and a mother's nipple again the mother's nipple flattens and elongates and kind of flattens out into like a platypus tail in the baby's mouth in the infant's mouth and that actually widens the arch. I mean, it makes the baby work harder. So the tongue muscles form differently. It's even the consistency of foods. Uh, we, we didn't have blenders when we lived in caves. Uh, babies didn't have much of a choice. It was mother's milk for as long as, you know, as long as they could. And then it was 
food that was probably pounded upon with rocks, but it wasn't as fine as, as baby food. So breastfeeding is important, uh, not just for the ingredients of mother's milk, but the whole action of it, the, the difficulty in it, certainly for the mother, but also for the baby. It takes them work and it makes them strong. It helps develop the airway and the swallow reflex. And I think this comes full circle and ties back around to what we discussed right in the beginning about is sleep apnea a newer phenomenon? And I don't have data specifically on this, but it seems like women are breastfeeding less and less. And I'm sure it's having an effect on babies' airways. And uh, it's just interesting how all this comes back around and ties in. It does. You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, and that's the epigenetic kind of aspect of our airways were compromised to begin with, and but we're, we're impacting it now even more by the lack of breastfeeding and all the environmental changes and factors. And one quick story, um, I just thought of it. There was a patient, it was probably the best set of teeth I've seen on anyone. He was a, was an Ethiopian young man, probably about age five or six, I want to say six. And uh, he was well adjusted. He jumped in the chair. It was his first dental visit. He wasn't fearful of anything. Uh, the teeth and the airway and the and the swallow reflex and no tongue thrust, being able to breathe through the nose, everything was just spectacular. No crowding, spacing between the teeth at that age. Everything was just was it was just textbook perfect. And I commented on that, and there were there were no there was no decay. This child did not grow up on fluoride. And when the exam was done, you know, the, the kid jumped out of the chair and he walked over to his mom, hopped into mom's lap, pulled up her sweater, and latched on. Ever since then, I mean, that was about 10 years ago, I thought to myself, what's the take-home message there? The take-home message is that this guy was breastfed for a long time. In the country that he's from, the minute the child's off the breast milk, he's, he's living in a state of poverty, that child. So I think breastfeeding is very important. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. I think stories are a really powerful way of getting a message across, and uh, that was great. So, Mark, I just want to wrap up our main part of the interview here asking you how, as listeners, can we go about finding an awesome dentist who's forward-thinking, is in line with a lot of this stuff we're talking about today? Because like you mentioned earlier, you're in Silicon Valley. I don't think all of us uh, can head into your office, although that would be fantastic. So how can we use the internet and find a dentist that's going to be aware of a lot of this? Right. That's a very good question. Um, I get asked that often. Certainly when a patient moves out of the realm of our practice, you know, we try and find someone for them. I think for a patient, and, and it's funny because a patient came in the other day and I said, how did, you, how did you find me? And he had a very novel approach. And I was really taken aback by it because it never occurred to me. He went to a specialist. He went to a, a gum surgeon and then asked the specialist where would you send your family or who, who's the best dentist in the area? And I guess the specialist, I guess is, you know, he's impartial in a way and that's where the referral came from. But I think in general, I think I would go as a patient, this may be difficult. Uh, word of mouth is, was kind of the old method. Forget the yellow pages. Don't do Yelp. Don't do any of those types of things. That is uh, not a great way. In fact, that can get you into trouble. And if you're not limited by your plan, that's the other issue. A lot of plans give you a list and you have to pick off the list. And that's the most difficult way and most risky way to find a dentist. But let's say you can pick whoever you want. You have a plan that allows you to do that. I would go online and I would find out someone. I would find someone who is educating people via a blog or a website or lectures, podcasts, whatever. And I would, I would go that route. That's someone who's interested in making a connection with patients. Uh, he's got a message. He's got a method. And I think that's the new modern way of finding someone online. I mean, I, it's like dating. It's like online dating. That seems to work. I have a lot of patients come in and I've known them for a while. And I go, well, how'd you hook up with your new hubby? Or, and, you know, you're, you're in love and it's taken you not very much time. It was online dating. Well, that makes a lot of sense because it shows you that there's a personality there too. You know, it's not just your practitioner, you're connecting with them on a very different level. And I think, you know, a lot of our listeners are for sure going to connect with this and hopefully they can, you know, find someone like you in their area. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch gears into a rapid fire question Uh round. We're just going to ask you things, just answer the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. The lightning round. Yes, I've heard about this. The lightning round. You got (laughs) it. You got it. Okay. First thing. 
What makes you feel most alive? Oh, um, seeing a patient turn around after not sleeping for 10, 20, 40, 50 years and just seeing and hearing what they have to say. What is your favorite health book besides yours, of course? Well, uh, there are a lot of good books out there currently or of all time. All time. Ooh. Well, I, the most influential was Life Extension by Pearson and Shaw. I think that really woke me up. That was 30 years ago. Wow. Great. Where is your favorite vacation spot? Ooh, boy. That's a difficult question. First impulse, without even thinking, was Italy. Nice choice. I haven't been, but uh, Marnie loves it there. What are you most excited about right now? I'm really excited about my book. I know that sounds very self-serving, but uh, I'm really excited about the book. It's affecting change. I get emails three or four times a day from people all over the world. They have questions, of course, or they have success stories or just thanks for, you know what, this all makes sense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on this. So I'm very excited about the book and promoting it, of course. And But the message, um, I, I get goosebumps talking about it. So I'm sure that'll wear off and it'll be something else soon. But I love treating people with uh, and seeing people change after they wake up. Awesome. Let's share the title of your book. The Eight Hour Sleep Paradox. How we are sleeping our way to fatigue, disease, and unhappiness. Awesome. And we'll share that. We'll link that up in our show notes so everyone can go ahead and get a copy of that. Thank you. So who inspires you? Who inspires me? Oh, my goodness. That's a very difficult question. Again, I just go, what was the first thing that popped in my my mind? It was my father. I mean, my mother was inspirational. I dedicated the book to both of them. But I think my father, I mean, what he did for radiology, he pretty much invented interventional radiology. He was really about educating and, and thinking outside of the box. So I think that would be kind of a, just a quick answer would be, would be that my father. Great. And last rapid fire is what is one misconception people have about you? That I think everyone has sleep apnea. Okay. Good one. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's uh, I sometimes get that from my patients, uh, and I'm, you know, aware of that, of course, but, you know, I have some patients, the ones that are in denial, you know, after an hour with them, they're like, you, you didn't mention the sleep apnea thing. I said, well, I did last time, you know, but, uh, <laughs> so I think, I think that's maybe one misconception people have. Of course, not everyone does. I have lots of healthy patients with great airways. So what is one healthy habit that you can give our listeners to take away after the show? Uh, in terms of sleep or dental or just in general? Anything, yeah. Just something they can walk away with from listening to this or something you would suggest, something that they can implement right away. Okay. Uh, again, first thing that popped in my mind, a lot of people don't like to floss or they can't floss or they don't feel they're good at it. I would say pick up a floss stick. They are wonderful. Every time I come across someone that is not a chronic flosser, you know, and the excuse usually is I don't have time or I, I can't wrap that floss around my fingers and get it done right. The coordination isn't there. Uh, and I introduce this floss stick to them. They come back six months later and they floss. They floss almost every day. It's a one-handed operation. It's like holding a pencil and drawing on your teeth. And you can text and floss at the same time. It's, it's a quick and easy thing. And, of course, overall oral health is good for your overall systemic health. What happens in the mouth happens in the body. So if you can become a flosser just by picking that up, it's just a quick and easy, inexpensive, easy thing to do. Wow, that's awesome. I haven't heard of one of these devices. Is there a certain brand name or can you send us a link after the show? We can put it in the show notes. Absolutely. So it was made by J&J Reach, uh, the Reach uh, toothbrush brand. And it's very well made. I think it's the only one of its kind. I'm not talking about the ones that you hold between your the little, the little, it's like a it's like a pencil and it has a little horseshoe shaped piece that you can pop off and put a new one on. And between the two arms is a little piece of floss. And you lit, I have a video of it on the website. So a demo, I'm giving a demo, a video demo uh, on our YouTube site. And it's funny because people say, don't bite down on it. I would say, absolutely. You put it in your mouth, you gently bite on it. So instead of digging in and pushing and over pushing and cutting your gums, you're pushing from the actual point, the fulcrum, and it's so much easier to do just by gently biting on it and the floss pops in there. Then with the pencil end, you just kind of move it around and 
do the little C shape around each side of the tooth, each adjacent tooth, and then you pop it out and then you bite down on, on, the, on the next contact. So it's very simple to do. Unfortunately, J&J has decided not to make it anymore. And I think now the Listerine brand makes it. I'm not a big fan of Listerine. You've heard me say that before about mouthwash, but they make it. It's the same mold and same, pretty much the same packaging. And uh, I'm consulting for a startup, a toothbrush oral device and health company in New York. And uh, we're working with them and we are going to make an even better version of it. So it's available via the Listerine brand, and it's a great thing to do. I would I have them stashed everywhere in the car, at work, at home, here in the study. It's a fantastic device, and it works well. Awesome. Well, we'll actually find that video and link it up in the show notes so people can just go there, hit play. And again, listeners, ultimatehealthpodcast.com, and everything will be right there. And last thing I want to touch on related to this, Mark, I just have to mention it, is our favorite way of flossing currently. And I know you're a big fan of this brand, Dr. Tongues. Have you used their Smart Floss? Because Marnie and I are addicted to this stuff and it's really changed the way we go about flossing and it, it just works amazing. Yeah. So I'm curious, why do you like it? I like it just because I. it's non-abrasive between the teeth. It's just thicker. It really... I, I just find it gets more out. It seems, it seems like you're doing, you're actually cleaning something. You're actually getting stuff out. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Plus it has, I think it might be cardamom right on it. And and I think that has an antibacterial effect it too. Does. So it's it's just great. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think that's a great company. They've got some really cool things. Uh, I've blogged about some of their products. There's also another product out there called uh, Coco Floss impregnated with coconut uh and that's you've heard me say things about oil pulling i mean that's also great but the cardamom the coconut uh there are some flosses that work better than others and certainly finding a floss that you like the taste and the feel and that's the way to go all right mark well this has been a great time chatting with you and i want to leave the listeners with a way where they can go and connect with you after the show find out more about you what would that way be? I think the best way is just to go to askthedentist.com. That's our main site where we're trying to change the oral habits of everyone that's listening. So you can follow me on Twitter, uh, askthedentist.com again, ask the dentist. And certainly uh, my email is on the website. Certainly contact me directly. I'd be happy to help. Well, Mark, thank you so much. Again, this has been great. And yeah, I'm sure we could talk forever and, oh, yes. and just get into so much more, but we'll save that for round two, hopefully down the line. Great. Sounds great. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Yes. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Martin. Take care. Bye-bye. So that was an amazing episode with Mark. We had an amazing time talking to him and we hope you guys loved it as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts. So join us over in our Facebook group at ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash community. That's where we bring up all kinds of awesome conversation and keep things going all week long until the next episode. So we'll see you over there. Have a great week, guys. And we will be talking to you soon. Take care.